Dedication to protecting people. Respect for all. Enforce the law with honor. Integrity our standard. Quality our mission. As we demonstrate leadership in law enforcement, these are the core values inside the LAPD. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside the LAPD. I'm Mary Grady, Public Information Director for the Los Angeles Police Department. On the night of June 3rd, 2006, life changed in an instant for LAPD officer Christina Rapati. On that night, she and her partner were working in the southwest area of Los Angeles. They were chasing a man who had just robbed a gas station. He shot Officer Rapati several times, one of those bullets hitting her spine and paralyzing her from the chest down. In an instant, she went from being a healthy and fit cop who loved nothing more than chasing dangerous suspects and putting them behind bars to fighting for her life. Now, this wife, mother, and officer is learning to adapt to a new life confined to a wheelchair. I played soccer in high school and college, um, and I think I majored in athletic training in college. So, you know, I thought maybe I wanted to stay something in the sports field. And it wasn't until you know my senior year where I'm searching for careers and started going to career fairs that I started looking into law enforcement. I started looking at FBI and found out you had to have a master's degree or some professional experience or have some experience with a law enforcement agency. That's when I looked up LAPD. As soon as I started getting into it, probably in the academy, and I started to hear like what the job entailed, then I was like, I don't want to be an FBI agent. This is what I want to do. Well, I never wanted a job sitting behind a desk. I wanted, I like the spontaneous nature of the job where at any time you get in the car, you never know what you're going to deal with. It's always changing. I like running after people and running after bad guys and chasing them. And, um, you know, as I got into it, then working gangs, I really like doing that. Every time you go out, you're making a difference somehow. The job definitely drove me to be even more active because I felt very much a need to stay in top physical condition. And as soon as I started running and then working out, it became a hobby for me as well. Not just, I wasn't just working out for the job, it, the, um, working out became a hobby for me. And I enjoyed, very much I enjoyed running and doing my circuit program, my weight program at the gym. and. Uh, along with other things like surfing and, you know, my husband and I would go fishing and dirt bike riding and stuff. So we always like to be on the go. Let's go back to that, to, to the night of um, June 3rd. Um, you had actually been in a couple of foot pursuits earlier that night? Uh, yeah, we had had, you know, a couple little foot pursuits of guys uh, just prior to that prior to uh, the shooting. We saw basically the guy just kind of walked right in front of our car and walked over to the side of the street. And he looked at, he was acting really, you know, what we would say shady. And um, looked like, you know, typical base head, you know, smoker. And First, we weren't going to stop him, but he was, like I said, acting really shady. It looked like he had dropped something, and we decided we need to, you know, see what's up with this guy. And then what happened? Um, I got out of the car. I was the passenger officer, so I get got out of the car, and I approached him first. And I told him to stop. He immediately took off running. I chased him. Uh, it was just a short foot pursuit. I chased him onto 
uh, through along and onto uh, his front porch. I didn't know it was for his front porch. It ended up being his front porch. And he tried to get into a door. Um, I remember grabbing onto him. And then I just remember, it seemed like I remember the gun really close to my face and just the smell of, very strong smell of gunpowder, what I remember the most. And the next thing I remember, uh, I'm on the ground and my partner's over me and I'm trying to get up and he's keeping pushing me down and, and I'm telling him to get off me and let me up. I don't know if I knew at the time that I couldn't move my legs and maybe that was panicking me also. But I just, I remember him, you know, over me. And then I remember him uh, telling him, you know, stay with me and, you know, think of Jordan, my little baby, and think of Tim. And, yeah, I don't remember a whole lot more. I remember Tim, Tim's voice when he arrived and um, him telling me, you know, to fight and, you know, think of the baby. Well, you know, I told her that, you know, she really made the most of her life, you know, the way she was before June 3rd. She's gonna, I know the kind of person she is, she's gonna make the most of her life the way she is after June 3rd. And she's really lucky because she gets two, two different lives and she's gonna maximize both of them, you know? And maybe one day she'll be walking again. I do remember something, I guess, in the operating room because I remember the bright lights and the doctors over me and um, them telling me the same things, to stay with me, stay with us, stay with us. And I was trying to say, like, I'm here, I'm here, thinking that they could hear me, but now realizing that they couldn't. According to Tim, you know, I woke up several times and I said, I can't feel my legs. And he said, yeah, you're paralyzed. And I would go, okay. Like, not much reaction to it emotionally or anything. And then a few hours later, Tim, I can't feel my legs. And I know, you're paralyzed. And then even the next day. So he said it was like Groundhog Day all the time. When the doctors told me that she was going to be paralyzed um, in the trauma room that night, I thought, okay. When I, the second doctor told me after they did the CT scan, they said, most likely she'll be have her hands. And I thought, okay, we can deal with that. You know, I know she can deal with that mentally. I know I can deal with it. And right there I saw how ways around everything that we like doing. So I think right away I saw there's light at the end of it. I'm, she's not dead, you know? And I honestly believed that she was going to die. Um, and I, I'm a super optimistic guy. and. I just on the circumstances, what I saw that night I was convinced. So anything beyond that is bonus. And you know, there's light right there. Okay, I'm paralyzed. And it really, because it hit slow, it, like it was a gradual realization, I really don't think it really hit me actually till I got to the rehab hospital and all the commotion had kind of calmed down. I wasn't getting as many visitors and then I sit in my room and I'm like, I'm paralyzed. You know, I can't walk anymore. And then it kind of, it really hit me. I think at that point you go through a lot of stages, um, stages of loss and grief that you just, there's a lot of stuff you think about. You know, at first I was like, okay, well, I'm paralyzed. Let's get on with my life. I just want to get out of here. But then you do, you can't just go on like it didn't, nothing happened. You know, something big did happen. And I have to, uh, I still am. I go through those stages, the loss, the stages of grief. And it's hard, you know. It's hard to not be able to get up and walk across the room just to get, you know, a piece of paper or whatever and it's a lot of adjusting i am absolutely so impressed with her um i was impressed with her when i met her when i worked with her when she became my friend and you know that's why i married her and she constantly proves herself uh 
to be just tough, uh, you know, fighting person who, you know, always improving on herself and just, you know, she's just a great person, you know, and <clears throat> when I, I watch her just battle through this problem that we're in now, I'm just, I just equally, you know, more so than ever before. The active life I led before definitely drives me to get on and push forward now with this new life. However, I think if I was, it might have been almost easier if I was, you know, a couch potato, then I wouldn't be missing running and working out and all these things that I do miss. Um, but, you know, I think it, for the better, it, you know, definitely drives you and, you know, pushes you forward. Just try to get on and be more independent and get back to my normal life. I can see how it's baby steps for her trying to relearn things, um, how to adapt to living in that chair, you know. That was a real good one. That was very good. You know, like when we take her to the gym, we have to figure out all new things for her to do. And, but in some ways that's kind of fun because when you, you, you know, reach one of your goals, you know, or she, you see her, you know, doing something new or that she couldn't do before, you know, just two weeks ago or whatever, it's really neat to see see her get into it. In the city of Los Angeles, when duty calls, the LAPD responds. 911 emergency. 990, my daughter's missing. How old is your daughter? She's four years old. Her name's Janelle. I lost my puppy. Can you help me? We have a critical missing. There is an Amber Alert, so let's look for any information you get. Pass that into the watch commander. Let's be careful out there. To fight crime and to keep our streets safe. I'd be going nuts if this was my daughter. Push eight, it's at 785 to protect and to serve all units code for live the Catalina suspect standing with our community Los Angeles Police Department this morning issued an Amber alert the suspect is driving a black Honda Civic working as a team I think I saw that car that you were looking for. Can you show us? Yeah. Let's go. They take pride in what they do. Okay, nine, ten, code six on the and when duty calls, the LAPD responds. It's positive on the vehicle. Roger. Flash like two, we have positive on the Ambler vehicle. It looks like they found the car. <laughs> LAPD is hiring. Become a part of the team. Visit us at joinlapd.com. In the city of Los Angeles, there is an Amber Alert. When duty calls, the LAPD responds. We have a positive on the Amber Alert vehicle. Mama, to protect and to serve. Okay, tell me what happened. Do you want to make a report? Your brother-in-law doesn't want you to stand there anymore. You all right? Yeah. Okay. Standing with our community. When we first got there, I didn't know what the heck we had. 1653, unknown trouble. Male and female arguing inside of a green vehicle stop on the 6th Street Bridge. Respond, code 3. Any area that come in on home.
Leave us alone! Driver's got a gun. 16, 253, requesting backup. 415, man, what a go. We're on the 6th Street Bridge facing westbound. Hello. All right, show me in route. For the officers of the LAPD, it's all in a day's work. Working as a team, they take pride in what they do. I'm not coming out of the car. OK, listen, we've got time to work this out. Shut up! Let's just talk right now. This has nothing to do with you, man. I know you're upset. I want you to talk to me. Girl that's missing? Yeah. What's, What's your name, sir? Hello? 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 The caller's DOA. Get away from the car or I'll shoot her! I'm gonna kill her, man! Listen to me. Why don't you just let her go? The girl's coming out. Hey John, lower the gun, buddy. a part of the team. The LAPD is hiring. Visit us at joinlapd.com. Any hip pain or anything? Any hip pain? Hip pain. No. Uh, no. Remember, I can't feel my legs. I get, I'm, you know, really inspired by a lot of people I meet in wheelchairs and, you know, when I see them rolling in and they look normal and doing normal things in their lives, I'm like, yeah, you know, wow, and it really picks me up. Never give up and push yourself to be better and that definitely helps and, you know, when I'm wheeling up a hill or something, I think I can't make it or just simple things. It's like taking baby steps now. So I have to push myself always and, you know, kind of be disciplined every day to go through the steps and do what I have to do. Oh, I'm completely surprised and overwhelmed with the love and support that we've gotten from this. I, a lot of times I'm like, oh, I don't understand, you know, why? Why why for me, you know? I was doing my job and, you know, Tim and I talk about it a lot and, you know, it's amazing and we're so appreciative of it. it I have just boxes of cards at home and I sit and I read them and, you know, I'll get some really inspiring, you know, letters from people I don't that don't even know me, you know, but they're opening out, up their hearts and, you know, it's amazing. And, you know, if I can give back to people like that someday, it would be great. I run into officers all the time who don't know us, but just feel compelled to set up a fundraiser or something. And just, I mean, just beautiful acts of kindness people are, are you know, doing for us. And um, it just, it really, uh, it's really a, <laughs> a breath of fresh air and then it <clears throat> also you know, makes you want to be a better person, you know, and, and recognize other people, and, you know, when you can and stuff. And like Christina said, I totally agree. I, I hope that we can give back in some way, you know, or help out in some way and, you know, just do the best that we can. I don't know if I could ever do it in the way that people are giving to, to me right now. And I've learned, you know, a lot about people through this and you know what they'll do look at Joe Joe was I mean he what an awesome partner he is you know he took care of business there he took care of Christina he he was plugging her bullet hole where she was bleeding out with his finger while he's broadcasting for help on his radio and getting getting the troops to her and then the, the SWAT officers you know who got there and did you know all the CPR and on her 
and <clears throat> you know all the officers that responded and, and helped and then all our friends that have surrounded us and been there and just you know helping in any possible way um, just you know she's just so lucky we're both so lucky you know to have our LAPD family you know our you know just our friends and our, our family at home and just we just I can't say enough it was a, a tough decision <clears throat> um, when we were first approached to talk to the media you know of course I, w I went back and asked Christina I said hey what do you want to do how do you want to handle this the media wants to talk to us and she said which to my surprise she said no, let's talk to him because maybe somebody will see this that can help me walk again. And I thought, oh, that's a good point, you know. <clears throat> and uh, so I went down and, uh, and talked to him and, you know, then a whole series of media um, interviews after that. And uh, it's, it's just a tremendous amount of help has come our way uh, because of that. Um, people, you know, attention being brought to her. Um, I think it was, you know, very wise for Christina to make that decision because um, a lot of very um, exciting opportunities are opening up, you know, um, for cutting edge rehab, um, doctors, you know, in other parts of the country that specialize, you know, in Christina, Christina's uh, injury. I'm I'm glad that people see her uh, her progress. You know that they're able to see her progress because uh, you know it, it will be inspirational for somebody if it helps one person. You know that how, how good is that? That you know um, you know a lot of officers have talked to me and said they you know they have spouses on the job and stuff and really worry about their spouses, but you know it, goes, it shows you that. Something traumatic can really happen, and and uh, you can get through it, you know, and still be happy. And uh, so, if they can see that and make them feel more comfortable, that's good too. Definitely want to walk again, and I'm going to do everything I can, take every step I can, um, so that happens. I'm not going to put my life on hold until I walk again, but um, you know, I don't know. It's a slow process. If I can walk again at this point. I'll be, you know, that'll be cool. And then, you know, if I go back to the job, that's like, <laughs> that would be icing on the cake. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. If you get caught, with an illegal gun in L.A. Now you can be sent to federal prison, far away from your friends and family. So, if you think it's cool to carry an illegal gun or commit a crime with one, you've been watching too much TV. In the city of Los Angeles, when duty calls, the LAPD responds. Hey, John, lower the gun, buddy. John, leave the gun. Working as a team. Go ahead and put the gun down. John, nobody's going to come at you, all right? But I'd feel a whole lot better if you were to lower that gun. To protect and to serve. Why don't you come back here to me, all right? All right, that's good. Walk toward me with your hands up, John. Put you in handcuffs. All units code 4 so Thanks for working with me. K9 turn, show me code 6 on the auto search for the Amber Alert. To fight crime and to keep our streets safe. Another positive hit on this bag. We believe at this time that the vehicle is in our custody. Any available unit to respond to the northeast corner, 7 and Gordon for the Amber Alert. 6K253 rides. Fourteen X eleven, show us responding. Cycle two, we're in round. This is it. Let's go.
for the officers of the LAPD, it's all in a day's work. Protecting our families. Look, look at your daddy. They take pride in what they do. Call from the Amber Alert. Missing child found and returned to parent. Suspect in custody. LAPD is hiring. Become a part of the team. Visit us at joinlapd.com. Officer Rapati is one of those rare individuals that despite life's adversities, she never gives up. Christina is a fighter, and she says she's going to stay as strong as she can in the hopes that someday modern science may help her walk again. She says she wants nothing more than to once again proudly wear the LAPD badge. I'm Mary Grady, thanks for watching, and join us again next time for another Inside the LAPD.